every day around the world, you hear with increasing frequency, you should eat a plant-based diet. Red meat is bad for you. Processed meat will cause cancer of the butthole. Well, I've got a fellow physician with me today, and we are going to talk about eating meat as part of a proper human diet, eating meat as a method of cancer prevention. Now, uh, we're going to be live on all three platforms because I'm sure that there is a chance that we will be censored on one platform or another. So I want you to take this opportunity to share this with as many people and in as many places as you can because Dr. Sean Baker and I are about to tell it just like it is. Dr. Baker, get in the frame and say hello. Hello. Hey, <laughs> Ken, good to have you. Good to see you, man. Hey, brother, good to have you back. It's been a, a while since you were on my channel, and it's been too long, and I appreciate it. I don't, I don't think it. I've ever been on your channel, I think. I don't Maybe you're right. Maybe I've been on yours, but I've yeah, been, been on mine a few times. I think this is my first time to to, to – get into these hallowed halls here. So thanks. I for think you're me. right. And, and I've, I've been remiss and I apologize. Now, if you hear anything in the background that sounds like the, the baying of sheep, it is, we have sheep in the front yard. They're moving to a new paddock and they're spending the day in our front yard. Yeah. I heard, I heard you're starting to become a bit of a farmer. So good for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. You got to yeah. walk the walk. So That's Dr. Sean Baker, welcome. Welcome. If you guys have not done so, please share this on all your social media because uh, recently I had a post on Instagram basically saying that uh, sun exposure is good for you, not bad for you. Uh, get the little uh, fact checker uh, opaque screen. And I know you just had something on YouTube that that had, was messed with. Tell us what happened there. I, I still don't know, man. Can I, I, I literally did not talk of anything that I could even potentially think is conscious. Other than I said eating meat was healthy. Maybe that was it. Maybe they've gone to the point where now if you just say eating, I said, I think people should eat more meat less than rather than less meat. Maybe that's what got it. I don't know. I, I thought it was a pretty tame, tame thing. And yeah, we are living in an era where there is this rampant censorship. And you know, when you get some liberal arts degree person, fact checking physicians on health is, is it, it, it's, it's a bizarre, it's bizarre world. So anyway, you're on, this is on, you said three streams. So what are you you're on YouTube and what else? YouTube, Facebook, and x and so i'm pretty sure yeah, we're yeah. safe on x and so if uh we've got already 1800 people in the stream if you guys are not already on x aka twitter i would highly advise you to do that it's quickly becoming the only free speech platform out there and i don't forget about me we gab vero uh clapper there's lots of other social media people think that there's not but there is and i would encourage everybody to go ahead and sign up for all of them and because, I mean, you never know when the wrong person's going to be appointed CEO of this uh, social media or that social media. And all of a sudden, everything you've posted there is now gone. And so I try to post on all of them uh, just out of an overabundance of caution. Where do you see censorship going? in the next months and years, Dr. Baker, what, what do you think, what do you predict is going to happen? Well, I, you know, I mean, obviously we went through this whole thing with the COVID sort of thing where, where that was, I thought over the top. And I just think we're going to see more and more of the same. I mean, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, certain topics you're not allowed to talk about, you know, or, you know, we, I, I saw people had to like use code words and just, you know, just sort of <laughs> game the system in a way. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, the message that both you and I share that, hey, eating, eating meat is, you know, be, eat, eat, eat meat, be happy like my shirt uh, is is going to be at some point, perhaps not allowed to be spoken about. Perhaps. I don't know if we go to that, if we say, uh, well, it's too bad because cow farts are killing the bull in the oceans and we just have to we can't we can't talk about that anymore. So it could be. I hope not. I mean, it, it's you know, we're seeing some really weird stuff going on in Brazil right now. I don't yep. know if you saw some of that stuff where there yeah. Canada has some crazy laws around there, podcasting and stuff like that. So we're get, you know, depending on what part of the world you're in, and you're right, Elon Musk at Twitter has done, you know, he's he's done a lot to try to protect that, but even he is at risk and, and he's taken a lot of backlash for that. I know Rumble up in Canada has a, a decent platform. Um, so you know, I mean, it's hard to to keep a good message down. I mean, that's tough. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing uh, how 
many people are now sharing this message, which is something that I've said from the beginning. Don't just rely on me or Ken to, to talk about this. We all have to talk about it. So, Absolutely. I mean, they can, they can, they can, you know, they can, they can, it's, they can, you know, cut a few people off and, you know, but, but if there's millions of mosquitoes flying around, it's tough to deal with. And so I like to tell people just be those annoying mosquitoes and keep sharing these messages because Absolutely. this is how we fight back. And it's a great, it really is a grassroots uh, sort of endeavor. You know, we're not, I don't care who's the next president. They're not going to come out and say, eat more meat. This is not happening. Right. Uh, you know, or at least I don't expect, I'd be shocked if they said that. So we've got to do it ourselves. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, like Ken says, diversify your social media. I'm on multiple platforms. I probably could be on more. It's just, <laughs> it just takes a lot of work. The pain in the uh, butt. It really yeah, is. But yeah. I think in the long run, it's going to be worth it. Uh, one thing that, that people watching, uh, we've got almost 3,000 watching now, and let's let's try to get that up. Hit the thumbs up, hit the heart, uh, leave a comment right now, guys. Tell me where you're watching from in the world, what city, what state, what country. The more engagement, the more this is going to get thrown out there for people who have never heard the good news that you can improve your chronic medical conditions by eating a proper human diet. People just don't know that. They think they're stuck with big pharma and big food. They don't know there's an alternative that's been proven to work in hundreds of thousands of people. So please, please do everything you can to engage with this video. What a lot of people watching probably don't understand because they're not in, they're not in the, in the bind that you and I are, is that if a, a foreign government, let's say the UK or the EU, if they tell Facebook or X or uh, Instagram, hey, if you we are not going to allow any messaging that says that eating red meat or processed meat is healthy, we're gonna we're gonna start fining you every time that's on your platform. Even though in the U.S. it still might be totally fine, they've got a hundred million people on their platform in the EU, or they've got twenty million people in the U.K they're liable to just turn it off worldwide because it would be such a pain in the butt for them to say, okay, we're going to have this set of rules in the EU, but a different set for the rest of the world. And so uh, I think that's that's a, a an unspoken danger that's out there that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, and so that's why I'm, I'm just like you. I teach, I teach everybody the just the basic principles of a proper human diet. And my call to action is now, Fix your health, then teach your family, then teach your friends. And I think that's what it's going to take to keep this movement going. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, the interesting thing is people go, you know, you've heard the criticism. Why would anybody just only eat a bunch of meat or mostly meat and uh, how awful it must be? And and the real reason people do it is because it just works. I mean, it just flat yeah. out works. And I mean, that's yep. that's the only reason this has grown to the extent it has. And, I, you know, as you know, Ken, I've been around since – sort of the beginning of this modern growth of this. And it is, I mean, I can't even keep up with the number of people that are doing it now. It's just, it's just amazing, which is, it is. a testament to, to one people's openness to try stuff, but, but also the efficacy because it would, there would not be people doing this diet if it didn't work. And I wouldn't want them to, I mean, right. you know, Absolutely. Ken and I both went to medical school, presumably to help people. And, you know, I mean, I got jaded by the system. I found out that I wasn't really helping people as much as I'd like to or could or was even even allowed to. And, and then having to take this very different course now provides me the uh, opportunity to to really help a lot of people. And it's I mean, from my perspective, I, I feel like uh, it's it's it's, it's un, I feel greedy because I get to get all these people getting better. And it really makes me uh it makes it fun to be a doctor, doesn't it? It does. It, it sure makes does. it fun to be a doctor because I can remember back in 2003, 2004, I would have a diabetic come in who's overweight. And I'd be like, okay, let me start you on metformin and let me start you on Gliburide and your blood pressure's high. Let me start you on metoprolol and, and your cholesterol's high. Let me start you on Zocor. And they'd come back in three or six months. They wouldn't feel any better. Yeah. Their numbers might be a little better, but not much. They'd have a whole new list of side effects. And they would just be like, I guess this is my life. I guess I'm just screwed. But then when I, when I reversed my own severe obesity and prediabetes by eating a proper human diet, and then I started recommending it to patients, you, you spoke about efficacy, which is a big fancy doctor word that means this shit works. And so when somebody tries carnivore or even keto or ketovore, just tries it for a few weeks, all of a sudden they're like, dude, I feel better already. Am I supposed to feel better already? And I see this coming from the full spectrum of social media. I see people in the homesteading 
uh, who have went carnivore. I see people, I see vegans every day who are like, yeah, I've been vegan for a decade or two. I went carnivore. Oh my God, what was wrong with me? Uh, I, it, you hear this coming from all genres of social media, from all walks of life. Uh, and it just makes it fun to be a doctor. What, what are the most surprising success stories you see on your end of this where you're like, wow, I can't believe this. First of all, I can't believe this person even tried carnivore. And secondly, I love it that they're having so much success that they can't even deny that it's working. Yeah, I've seen some really like head scratchers. I'm like, I can't, I, I couldn't understand why, why diet helps. You know, just before I get into that, you know, I think it's, you know, when you mention how much fun you have as a doctor now. And it's kind of interesting because we, you know, we started Rivero and we have hundreds of doctors that are lining up to come work because they want to experience, they're tired of the same system, just like the patients are frustrated with, uh, you know, they're just tired of the same old here, here's your lab, here's your pill sort of, sort of rat race. So a lot of physicians are, are excited to do so. I, I'm really happy with that. But I mean, for me, I mean, I mean, I remember the first time I saw someone with Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is a genetic connect connective tissue disorder. Their yeah. joints were popping out of place every day. As yeah. gal was a 57 year old ER physician, and I mean, she literally woke up every day with three or four joints completely dislocated. She had to start her day putting her shoulder in place, putting her ankle back in place. Lucky she was so, an ER doctor and no. Yeah, go back to the that. yeah, go back to the ER, and then working half the time, her shoulder would pop out of place at work. And so she went from that, 57 years old, went carnivore within a month no more dislocations. She started going to the gym, working out, getting stronger, lost weight, and she's never had a dislocation since then. So I thought that was really weird. Now I've seen subsequently several people with, you know, EDS or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome with that uh, gal with Tourette's syndrome, which, you know, is kind of a weird sort of neurological disorder where you have facial tics and you randomly swear and say weird things. That one, and she was a vegan kid. She was a 15 year old girl that wanted to beg her vegan parents, please let me eat meat so that I can get stronger for track and field. They said, okay, only if you buy your own, cook your own, we're not going to participate. She did that. She ended up going carnivore. And within, I don't know, three months, Tourette's syndrome is gone, which I thought was, wow, that is really yeah. weird. I've seen, you know, uh, some, you know, some really nice successes with dementia. Now we're seeing, you know, people that are in early stage dementia, you know, literally resigned to nursing facilities, you know, long, ter long care facilities, recovering and going back home. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I mean, I cannot, in my mind, I can't think of any disease or health condition that is not significantly impacted by nutrition. I mean, everything is, whether it's curative or not, it's still going to impact it. And I think that's so yeah. important. I don't care if you're going through chemotherapy for cancer, the nutrition still matters in that situation. Yeah. So I, I just say, look, it's, it, maybe it's a panacea but it has been so effective for damn near everything. I mean, I can't, you know, it's just like, there's not much I haven't seen to get improved by it. Right. And you know, the, in the, in the research studies, the placebo effect typically has a 20 to 30% uh, benefit. Uh, carnivore blows the placebo effect out of the water. And uh, one of my, my mentors in medical school, he had a, he had a tattoo, which for years I wanted to get. It was the caduceus and around it in Latin, it says it said better than placebo. And I would encourage any healthcare provider out there. You want to be better than placebo. And very often placebo works better than the pharmaceutical, uh, the drugs that you're prescribing. Very often placebo works better than the pharmaceuticals. And so I would encourage every healthcare provider. And I know there's a bunch watching this. I've seen you guys in the comments. Uh, you want to try to be better than placebo because that's that's actually quite hard to do. But I'm with Dr. Baker here. I have seen things that that I was taught in med school. That's 100 percent genetic. There's not a damn thing you can do about that. There is no prescription medication that makes that better uh, that I have seen people that I've met at conferences. They're like, hey, I've got fill in the blank, this genetic condition or that con genetic condition. And I asked you on a live and you said, I, I, I don't know if carnival will help you but it sure the hell ain't going to hurt you. And they went carnivore and they're like, dude, you don't understand. I was disabled. I couldn't have come to this conference six months ago. I've been, I've been carnivore for six months now and I'm actually able to attend and not be in a, in a scooter or, in, you know, walk with a walker. And I just keep seeing that over and over and over. And I think you were a lot like me. I think we've talked about this before. When I first started recommending keto and meat heavy keto and, and, and then eventually carnivore, 
I looked at it just as a temporary weight loss hack. I didn't know any of the physiology. I didn't know any of the nutritional biochemistry. I didn't understand how, how this could do anything except help you lose weight. But I kept getting these anecdotal reports of people with bone on bone knee osteoarthritis who were scheduled with the orthopedist to have a knee replacement. And they would come in for their three month or six months and say, dude, my knee does not hurt at all now. Do I still have to have a knee replacement? And I'm like, no, if your knee doesn't hurt, you sure the hell don't need to have that joint sawn out and another one hammered in. No, cancel that. And if it starts hurting again, you can always reschedule it. It's, it's amazing what the human body is capable of, even with genetic defects. When you eat a proper human diet, it blows me away. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you've been watching this. I know you've got Rivero and you're bringing physicians on and other healthcare providers left and right who are ready to, to enjoy practicing medicine again. And I love the work you're doing there. Uh, I'm announcing on this live now, this is world premiere. Nobody's heard this except of our, our private community who gets access to everything. Uh, me and a group of low-carb keto carnivore doctors are in the process of forming a new diabetes association. And it's tentatively going to be called the American Diabetes Society. And it will be rec the number one recommendation of this society will be a low-carb diet, whether that's low-carb, keto, ketovore, carnivore. I don't, I, it doesn't matter. You can start wherever you want to start. It can even be low-carb vegan if you want to start there. But absolutely, there's going to be a new diabetes association in town. And we're going to be giving good nutrition advice. And I just want to tell everybody, any super chats, super stickers, super thanks you send today, 100% of that will go towards funding, seed funding, getting the 501c3 set up uh, for the American Diabetes Society. That's, that's new. It's coming. The American Diabetes Association better look out because they've been giving shitty advice to diabetics for too long. Those days are over, okay? You're either going to have to fix your advice or you're going to cease to exist, ADA. I'm talking to you, Dr. Bob. I've invited you on this channel at least 10 times. Still haven't heard from you. I've had a, a Harvard pediatric endocrinologist who went to school with you reach out to you. Still haven't heard from you. Uh, your time's up. The American Diabetes Society is going to replace you. Um, tell us, tell us about Rivero.com, Dr. Baker. What kind of work are you doing there? What do you see for the future? Yeah, well, first of all, Ken, congratulations, and that's awesome. And I think, um, you know, let the market decide. I mean, you know, this is the way exactly. it's going to work. You know, if 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 you and the American Diabetes Society consistently do better than the ADA does, then you know, good. <laughs> and that's the way it should be. And I think we, you know, we should be held accountable by our results, not by Honestly. our algorithms that we, that we, uh, that we sort of do. So with Rivero, like I said, we are a, uh, you know, for a long time I was doing just health coaching and that stuff. And, and we saw that, you know, to really make the difference we wanted to make, we needed to be able to do a full medical practice. And so Rivero is, we're licensed in all 50 States. Uh, we just launched, uh, uh, about two months ago, we now have something like 10,000 people on the waiting list, which we are slowly getting to. So it's been, it's been very, there's, there's a need for this. There are a lot of people that are frustrated with the status quo of the healthcare system. This the same old managed symptoms, disease maintenance, as I like to call it. We're just going to maintain you in a perpetual state of disease with these drugs. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, when we, when we, we had a whole, huge crowdfunding that helped us to kick off and get our seed money going, we've, we've hired, you know, engineers to build the software algorithms, to build a software programs. We've, you know, we've, we have lots of clinicians coming on board. Uh, so our goal is to, uh, not necessarily carnivore for everybody, but some people that will need it, we'll, we'll do that. It's going to be, uh, you know, a diet heavy sort of treatment algorithm, you know, where we actually uh, treat the root cause of what's causing disease, hopefully mostly deep prescribed medication. We've already started taking people off meds. I mean, it's been really fun to watch already people coming off medications. Uh, you know, it's something that in my view, I think most people, I think, you know, do it for maybe a year and then get the hell out of healthcare. I mean, you know, I think, I think, you know, I mean, honestly, if we look at the 4.5 trillion plus dollars we spend a year, most of which 90% of which is on chronic disease in this U S bloated, inefficient, 
uh, in some cases, harmful system that we have, if yep. we could replace that with not making sick people, then we could reserve that for car accidents, childbirth, maybe a few infectious diseases, which what really we should be doing. I mean, uh, you know, when I was going through medical school and I rotated through my family practice, I just remember how uh, how unhappy the, 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 the primary care physicians were because they were like, ah, oh, these damn patients that never take their pills, they're always sick, they Awful. never get better. And Awful. I was like, I don't want any part of that. That's why when it became a surgeon, I was like, yeah, you break your leg, I, I, you know, I hammer a nail down your femur and I'm good. But then I discovered into my practice that I'm just doing, I'm just treating lifestyle, arthritis, rotator cuff tendons, all this stuff was just the consequence, the, the metabolic, the orthopedic consequences of metabolic disease and I eventually woke up to it myself. And so now we have this opportunity. And, you know, I mean, I'm thankful for people like you and other physicians that are willing to, because it's, you are putting your livelihood, your career at risk. I mean, it's easy just to total line, suck it up, just, you know, punch the boxes and, you know, code in your uh, billing, you know, your charges and just and keep your head in the sand and just keep doing. You'll make a good living. You'll have a nice house. Your kids go to a nice college. And your patients will still think you're a good guy, probably, but, you know, they're not really getting better. And, and right. I think you're really letting them down. So I mean, this is an opportunity to practice medicine as I think it should be. I think we should talk about curing disease. We should talk about not you need to be on drugs the rest of your life. We should talk about how you can. I mean, when I look at the resources we have in this country, in particular, the United States, we're, we're still one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. And yet we have a nation of sick, depressed, dependent uh, you know, patients that are disempowered, and this is a way to re to to empower yourself. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I guess I, I'm just super excited about this year, and as we scale up, as we are doing, uh, and and you know, like, and more people are doing this. And I think at some point, the allopathic system, big pharma, which is inextricably married to medicine, is going to get the message, and we'll see how they fight back. I'm sure they're going to. Uh, we'll see what kind of regu- I see what kind of regulations and senators yeah. and politicians mm-hmm. have got bought off and make it hard. But we're going to fight. I mean, why? You know, what else can you do? I mean, and that's all is- you can do. And I right. and I love it that there are so many people out there, Doctor Baker, who are, who are ready to fight with us. Uh, and and you don't say so. I've said this before, but let me say this again. I have never seen anybody who joined Weight Watchers or who started taking some of Eli Lilly or AstraZeneca's medications. And they were so blown away by how well it worked that they decided on their own to crowdfund and make a documentary about how damn well Weight Watchers worked for them. I've I've never seen that happen. I've never seen people be so excited by SlimFast or by uh, taking Fentramine that they're like, oh my God, I'm going to start an Instagram or I'm going to start a Facebook page and talk about Slim fat. No, no. Those people, if they're talking about slim fast or Weight Watchers, they're getting paid to talk about that. They're not going to talk about it because it's not that I- impressive. It's not that overwhelming. It's not that inspirational. But when you have somebody who goes keto, keto or carnivore, and it literally transforms not only their physical health, but their mental health as well, that person's on fire. They're like, holy shit. This is going to change the world. This is going to put the world back like it should be, like it used to be, like it was before everything was corrupted by big food and big pharma. People are on fire for this. And I love that. And it makes it so much fun to be a part of this movement. Um, You and I both have been visited by state medical boards in the past. I've talked about that multiple times. And I predict that as as this becomes more and more popular, as big food and big pharma's profits start to suffer, at some point, the bean counters are going to say, hey, you guys need to do something about Barry and Baker because uh, the, 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 the shareholders are starting to bitch about this. And so I suspect any day now, that uh, we're going to come up against significant resistance. I'm ready for that. I'm eager for that. I, 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 I'm asking, come at me. And I know a lot of people that my, my Nisha, that her blood pressure just went up when I said that. She hates it when I say that, but I'm sorry, but that's what it takes. It takes people putting their, putting their reputation, maybe even putting their life on the line to say, you know what? Enough is enough. You've abused enough people for enough decades. You've made enough billions of dollars 
let's let people be in charge of their own health again. And I know you're a big proponent of that. And I, I predict that the American Diabetes Society will be working closely with Rivero in the future and other organizations just like yours. Um, there are people in the carnivore community who are, have strong opinions about omega-6 versus omega-3, about pork and chicken. Let's talk about this. Do you? Is it possible to eat a carnivore diet right, correctly, properly, if you're eating pork and chicken, or is that just a, a no-go to do carnivore right? Yeah, I, I've seen that. And, you know, their concern around the omega-6 content of, of sort of pork and chicken, particularly conventionally raised pork and chicken, which is most – that's what we find most in the United States. Sure. And the same thing, people will make the argument versus grass finished versus grain finished beef. Um, to, to my knowledge, those are very much speculative sort of arguments. I sort of live in the real world and I deal with people that consume grain fed beef. I, I deal with people that eat pork. Some people do okay with it. Some people don't. I, I, I can't say that you know, these things are verboten that no one should eat them because that's not the reality that I've experienced. And so I think, yeah, you can eat pork, you can eat chicken, you can eat grain finished beef, you could eat, you know, farm raised salmon for that matter. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, you've seen, and you've seen it before people eating bologna and hot dogs, losing weight, restoring their health. So yeah. we know these things work. And so, you know, at, at some point it's like, you know, the enemy of good is trying to trying to go for perfection a lot of so I saw that was just something we used to say in surgery you get in there you'd be trying yep. to do something and then you try to get perfect and then you break everything it's like oh crap, I just did that so mm -hmm. so yeah I think you can I think you can do that and I, I I think you have to again what I tell people is don't trust me trust yourself look in the mirror can you know like Rick Reagan used to say trust but verify you know you can say okay, well, how's it working for you? Why not try it? See what's going on. Because I mean, hell, pork's cheaper than beef is. I mean, I personally prefer beef and I, I eat a lot of, but I'll eat bacon from time to time. I'll have a, a, you know, a pork chop every now and again. I mean, it's not my preference from a taste standpoint, yep. but at the end of the day, you've got to do what you can afford and you got to do what you enjoy. I mean, any diet that leaves you not liking the food or hungry is, is going to fail. I mean, that's just, yep. that's, that's just the absolute reality of this. Ken, I want to just just about the drug stuff, because I think this is, you know, often we see criticisms of ketogenic diets, carnivore diets. Oh, long term, we don't know what's going to happen. We, you know, we, we speculate, we speculate, and we should never do that. And yet, you know, as you know, the incredible benefits that people seeing here and now today are enormous. And you think about every drug that's on the market today, all these $5,000 a month biologic drugs. We have no idea what the 30 year long term data on that is going to be. Correct. And yet we prescribe them by the billions of dollars and yep. don't even think about it. We don't even blink. And yet you tell somebody to eat a diet that isn't full of a bunch of crap. And all of a sudden, oh my God, we don't know what's going to happen long term. It's ridiculous. It's total yep. speculative nonsense. And that's all they have left because <laughs> they can no longer deny the results that all of the people in the audience and my audience are putting up. You cannot deny when someone's dropped 100 pounds. You cannot deny when someone is off 10 medication. You cannot deny someone who's bedridden and suicidal is now happy. Those things are not something you can just sweep under the rug. So now they got to say, well, in 30 years, you're going to get this or that. That's like, you know, you might as well just look at, look at the, you know, do, do astrology at that point. This is like total BS. So exactly. And you know, yeah, I, right. I say this all the time. You're exactly right. I say this all the time when people say, well, there are no long-term safety studies for keto or carnivore. And, and I ask them very simply, I asked the guy in a recent debate this. I said, well, is there long-term safety data for the, di for the diet recommended by the American uh, Diabetes Association? And he said, well, I'm sure there is. And I'm like, well, are you sure? You should look into that because there ain't. There's not any long-term safety data for the DASH diet that the American Heart Association recommends. There's definitely no long-term safety data on Ozempic or Regovi or Mount Joro. There's literally none. The people who are currently taking those medications, they are the guinea pigs for the long-term study. That's how big pharma does their studies. They get So they don't have to pay to have a study done like we would do in the carnivore or keto community. They get paid to perform long-term studies. And you already see the only people who are making a Facebook page or an Instagram page about uh, Ozempic or Manjaro are the people who've been injured by it or by the attorneys who are going to get a huge payday when they do a class action lawsuit because it's hurting people. That's who makes Facebook pages about Ozempic.
not the patients who are taking it unless they've been harmed by it. Now, you touched on the quality of meat. And I agree with you. I think if all you can afford is hot dogs and bologna, and that's the only carnivore you can afford with some mustard thrown out, 100% do it. It's a thousand times healthier than eating the highly processed shit that Kellogg's, General Mills, and Post is going to try to sell you. 100%. Hot dogs and bologna, do it. I've got a YouTube video about that. Let's talk about the quality of meat because this is a lot of another thing that, that we just get in huge tussles in the carnivore community about. Cafe, cafe raised, factory farmed meat versus grass fed, grass finished, panda massaged, twenty eight dollar a pound, uh, you know, pristine meat. The the research I've seen shows that the the the, the grass finished is maybe has a three percent better omega three profile. It, it it has a few more polyphenols. And for those vegans watching this, yes, properly raised and properly fed meat does have polyphenols and phytonutrients in it. There's research to back that up. Uh, what, and so the main question that I bump up against, because I want to do, I want to be ethical and moral, but we got millions of people eating, eating meat. There's, if we just outlawed CAFO factory farm meat, millions of people would starve to death. We can't do that. But at the same time, I want to encourage as much as I possibly can, people who can't afford it, please buy locally raised, regeneratively ranched, grass finished beef, pork, chicken, eggs, everything. How do we get from where we're at right now, Dr. Baker, to the point where uh, every county in America has got five or 10 regenerative ranches where they're raising regenerative chicken, eggs, pork, sheep, beef? How do we get there, but still uh, behave as ethical, moral humans? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that's a tough question because, and you're absolutely right, Ken. I mean, right now, uh, we are in a very fortunate time that we can produce as much food as we can worldwide. I mean, we went from a lot of people starving to a bunch of fat people. So we, we are very good at producing calories. There is more food in the world now than we need. It's just a distribution problem. That's why we still have starving people. But yep. as, far as, as far as what is going to change the way we raise for instance, beef. And I've been to, uh, you know, and, and I've, I've interviewed gazillions of regenerative guys, Alan Savory, you know, uh, Glenn Elzinga, uh, uh, you know, everybody you can think of in that Greg Judy, uh, Joel Salatin, uh, Will, Will Harris from White Oaks, you know, Gabe Brown up in North Dakota, all those guys, and they're doing wonders and it's tremendous and it's improving not only just uh, the, the, the overall agriculture, but the overall ecosystem um i think it's going to come down to um again market demand we have got to ask for it if, if, if it's going to happen there has to be demand the, the rancher has to because the guy currently in the industrial system has got to see a path for he has to see a demand for this and if there's no right now the demand is at the feedlot hey i can get whatever i can for my for my fat you know for my cow so i can they can fatten them up and that has been the system that's been going, it's multi-generation has been going on probably since about starting around World War II, I think, and, you know, increasingly since the 70s. Um, I think that, yes, it's important to support your local ranchers. Most people, you know, a while ago in the Netherlands, there was a lot of sort of kerfluffle in the news about 3,000 farms being shut down due to concerns around nitrogen fertilizer. And everybody's like raising holy hell about that. Yep. Did you know in the United States since about the 1970s, we have lost something like 600,000 ranches? Small 600,000 yeah, small ranches have gone under. And that's concerning, right? I mean, uh, and if that trend continues, and which it is right now, then what will happen is the food becomes further and first, further centralized. And a centralized food system is something that you have very little control over. When it's decentralized, you can say, I want to go to this guy. I want to go to that guy. I prefer this. Once there's only one thing, then it's like whatever's cheapest. What is it? Whatever's most profitable. Hell, we might get ground beef mix, mixed with soybeans and crickets. Who knows? I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I think we have to support these ranchers. I mean, ranchers are hardworking people. They are the salt of the earth, backbone of this country and many other countries. And I do everything I can to support ranchers uh, by just one, just buying meat helps. But two, if you can, if you got a local guy or you got someone that you like that's independent, support those guys as much as you are able to. And not everybody's able to, but 
buy a damn chest freezer as soon as you can and stick a bunch of meat in there and get a generator. Yeah. So the back, cause I had yeah. that, I had a fridge that went out. I was on vacation. The damn power went out and I came back and I had a thousand dollars of ruined meat. It just pissed me off like oh. nothing else. But, but yeah, I mean, I think we have to support these guys. I mean, that is, yeah. that is our future and it's your children's future and it's Absolutely. your grandchildren's and, future. And we actually had a freezer full of meat go bad at, in the basement of, of Nisha's mom and dad's house. And that's when I just started start. I decided to start storing a substantial portion of our meat in the pasture. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have a, a forty acre farm. We have sheep. We have chickens. We have turkey. Uh, when we've uh, improved the soil enough, we're going to have some cattle, but not time for that yet. But that's why I have sheep in the front yard right now, is because yes, not only do we need to support the local rancher every single time we can, and guys, I know money's money. I, I, I suspect Dr. Baker as well. I used to be broke as a joke back before med school, in the middle of med school. I was broke as a joke. I could not afford grass-finished beef. I was the guy living on hot dogs and bologna back then because that's all I could afford. But even if just once a year you buy a pound of ground beef from your local rancher, even once a year, once a month, once a, once a quarter, buy something from a local rancher if it's just a dozen eggs. Anytime you do that, you are voting with your dollars. You're stimulating that local economy. You're stimulating the resiliency, the anti-fragility of your regional area. The more ranches, the more farms, the more organic, regenerative things you've got going on in a in a hundred miles from your house, the safer you and your family are, and the less likely it is that you're going to wake up one day and the government. Uh, is is dropping off some crickets and some some ground up lizards with their drone because that's what you've been allotted to eat that month. If you got sheep in the pasture, if you got chickens in the hen house, guess what? They can take those ground up bugs and stick them up their ass. That's what I've got to say about that. And and I think the more of you guys who are supporting your local rancher or becoming the local rancher the less likely you are to ever have to have that serious conversation with your wife. I'm sorry, but we're going to have to eat bugs this week because I didn't think ahead. Yeah. I think, you know, you bring up a point. I've made this point before about voting with your pocketbook. You know, we got a presidential election coming up in November, a lot of elections around the world. We're all, a lot of people are concerned about that, but you get to vote every single day. And when you go to the store and you buy that cheap processed garbage from Nestle or uh, Nabisco or Coca-Cola, you are giving those guys power and yep. every dollar you give them, they get more power over you and, and they're not there to be your friend. They're there to take advantage of you and stick you into the sick care system. So you, it works both ways. You, you know, support your local ranchers, buy the right foods, but don't buy the garbage. And, and every time you do, they, they just get become more and more powerful. Yep. And again, we don't have a lot of power as individuals, but collectively as a market, we have tremendous power and we have to come, we have to sort of align ourselves and say, look, and help each other out. I mean, you know, within the community, help help support support your your friends and family. And like Ken said, teach your kids, teach your grandma, teach your brother. You know, and and that's how we that's how we do it. It's going to be step by step. But we, can, I I am optimistic that that we can change things. Um, you absolutely, know. absolutely. So. I, that's what I wake up every day thinking about how we can do that. We got ninety one hundred people watching this live right now. Let's get it up above ten thousand, guys. Hit the thumbs up or the heart if you haven't already done so. Leave a comment. Thank you, Curtis Waters, for all the comments. But somebody's going to put you in timeout if you don't stop commenting every every tenth of a second. Uh, everybody else, please leave a comment. Share this on your social media. The more because I I guarantee you, everybody watching this, they didn't even know what a carnivore diet was until they saw a post somebody shared on social media, and now they're literally using that to improve their health. That's how we all found out about this is somebody sharing information. So please don't be shy about sharing this information. Uh, you said earlier, you're not, you're not a, you're not a carnivore diet purist. If somebody can, can get healthy eating a low carb vegan diet, I'm, I'm fine with that. And I think you are too. What, how, and so I think there's three principles that, that a proper human diet has to adhere to. It has to be low carb enough. Because if you're eating too many highly processed carbs, you just it's, it's impossible. You're never going to realize your best health. I think that the diet needs to be very uninflammatory. And that's, a, that's something that freaks a lot of people out, Sean, is, is when you say red meat is one of the most uninflammatory foods on the planet. They're like, 
No. What are you talking about? Everybody knows that red meat's inflammatory. No, it's not. And then the third thing is your food can't be too hyper palatable. Though, if, especially if you're trying to lose weight, your food needs to taste good, but it can't be hyper palatable or you will overeat your satiety hormones and you'll wind up not losing weight. Uh, so low carb, uninflammatory, not hyper palatable. Those are the, the, that, those are the three criteria. And if you can do that on low carb vegan, uh, uh, do it, do it. But I don't think you can. I think maybe low carb vegetarian with enough eggs and cheese and, and, and fish I think you can do that for most people, but I think there's a subset of people, Dr. Baker, like me and you, we need to be as close to zero carb as possible. Uh, what, what do you think there's a spectrum, uh, kind of a normal distribution curve of people who can eat low carb vegetarian and do great? Other people who have to be as close to zero carb as possible. Do you think there's that variability in the human species? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, there's some, we're all, we all share the same, more or less DNA. Uh, yep. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of similarities from person to person. We all have some differences, obviously. Uh, and what I see, you know, with me, I I do best pretty much zero car. I mean, I've I've had my experiences where I've experimented. I, I just keep coming back to just give me a damn ribeye steak and I'm good. Yep. Um, I do think, and and, and again, to, to go back to Rivera, we have a whole system of you know low inflammatory sort of things. You know, diet diets for this autoimmune condition, diet for that autoimmune condition, which are based on a lot of data we've gathered on people that have shown that some people have a little greater tolerance for certain things. I know there's this thing that keeps coming back, this blood type diet. This guy, I think it was Dr. Diamo who came up with that. And in my view, you know, there's a blood type that allows you to eat meat. And I think it's called red blood type. As long as you have red, red blood, you can eat meat. Human blood. If it's green, then maybe you're, you know, you're Vulcan or something. You can have, some, you know, maybe you can eat some veg, you know, you can yes. eat vegetarian or something like that. But I think that, um, I think, I think we just have a little bit, greater or lesser tolerance for some of these other food but meat is a common uh part of the diet that i think all of our species has shared since whenever our spe whatever you believe our species began whether it be three million years ago or six thousand years ago if you follow a creationist model we've always eaten meat yeah. and it has always been part of our diet and it's always been uh a, an incredibly i mean you think about I mean, the, we are so lucky today because if, if we were to dial the clock back, you know, three, 400 years ago, you know, stay out of the King's hunting ground because he'll shoot your ass for stealing his right. deer. That's now right. we can go to the grocery store and find that stuff. So we're, so we're very fortunate. Uh, and, and, you know, since the advent of farming, uh, whatever it was, 12,000 years ago or so, humans have suffered with poor nutrition, poor dental health, all these deficiency states were prior to that, you know, when you could hunt your own elephants or whatever the hell we were eating you had a abundance of meat and it's never been like that since really the last 40 or 50 years. And, and, and now that people are waking up to it, I can eat like a King every damn day. Uh, yeah. and I don't have to eat the hyper palatable, you know, and I I've talked to people that have worked in that industry. I, I talked to a gal who was a food scientist for one of these major food companies. And she felt so bad that her career was dedicated to making this food addictive. She said, my job was to make this food addictive yep. and I feel bad about it. And it's true. I mean, it, it really is. This stuff, they know what they're doing. Believe me, they've got studies on all this stuff that, that we're trying to just discovering now. They know about this stuff. They know what they're Absolutely. doing. They're selling, they're, they're making hand over fist billions of dollars off of our suffering. And yep. it's 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 part of the price of the game to make a bunch of money. You know, you sell yeah. your soul. And I love it when I see a, a, a nutrition uh, epidemiologist or PhD from Tufts University or from Harvard School of Public Health say, well, there's no evidence that that any ultra processed food is addictive or habit forming, that sugar is addictive. That's a that's conjecture. That's foolishness. That's not true. But I guarantee you, Sean Baker, right now, let me go on the record and say that when a young and hungry assistant district attorney who's hungry, wants to make a name for his or herself. When they start a class action lawsuit against Kellogg's or Kraft Heinz or Mondelez and they get discovery, right? That's a legal term. When they get discovery and say, okay, we want all of your internal documentation, all of the internal studies, all the internal emails, these big food billion dollar corporations, they've known for at least a decade that they can make their products addictive so that people are literally addicted to them like they're addicted to cocaine. 
and, and it doesn't it doesn't work on everybody. Just like some people can do cocaine two or three times and then never touch it again. Doesn't doesn't affect them. Some people they do it one time. Cocaine the rest of your life are going to. They absolutely know. They've got the research to prove that what they're doing is making their junk food addictive. Guaranteed. I just need an attorney to file a class action lawsuit and get, get discovery and get all of their internal documents. And it's going to be Katie bar the door. Everybody's going to know at that point that ultra processed food can be made addictive. Yeah. I mean, it's clear. I mean, you know, that the sugar thing is kind of funny because people say, well, there's nobody snorting sugar or eating pure sugar, but let me, you know, let's take hundred percent dark chocolate, no sugar in it versus that with sugar. And you're going to binge a hell of a lot more on the stuff that's sugar because it, it's an ingredient that, drives like you said it drives appetite it you know it suppresses satiety and yeah i mean these clearly i mean moskowitz in the i guess was it the 70s early 80s came up with the bliss point and you know they i mean this has clearly been demonstrated and that's why you get people that that's one of the reasons i like carnivore because it's an abstinence sort of approach you know you don't tell an alcoholic hey just have a couple martinis on a weekend, you'll be good. That, that doesn't work for an alcoholic. And right. something like 14% of our population is, is considered to have food addiction, very similar to the, to the prevalence of alcoholism. So for a large significant of the population, you got to be pretty damn strict. And I think, you know, now, now something between low estimate, 3%, high estimate, 20% of the population now has IBS. And I call that, you know, instead of uh, irritable bowel syndrome, I call it you're eating the wrong damn food. That, that, that's, yep. that's the diagnosis there. Yep. So, yeah, you're eating food that's too inflammatory for your gut. And I think that's one of the reasons we see when somebody, regardless of what diet they were eating previously, but in many cases, it's, it's vegans or vegetarians. When they go carnivore, their irritable bowel syndrome, whether it's diabetes, uh, diarrhea predominant or constipation predominant, gets better. People with Crohn's disease, it goes into complete remission on carnivore. People with, with, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. It goes into near complete remission on a carnivore diet. And it's because red meat is the most uninflammatory food that a human being can put in their mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if that offends a few of you guys watching, because I know we got some vegan trolls in here. I, I, we welcome your questions as well. Uh, it helps engagement. So ask away. Or you can be as trolly as you want in the comments. That's fine. Because people who have tried carnivore, they're not going to be swayed by your, your little asshole comments in the comments. They know what worked for them. People who used to be disabled with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, they know what put that in remission. Your little snarky comments not going to change their mind. Uh, I often call the grain-based diet that started about 12,000 years ago, I call that the prisoner diet or the slave diet because invariably – the people who are in charge of a society, whether that's the dictator or the king or whatever, the emperor, they eat meat and eggs. But very, very often the people at the bottom of society are suspected, they're, they're expected to get by on beans and rice in some formulation, beans and wheat. That's that's it. That's all you get. You either eat that or starve to death. Do you, do you think that's a useful paradigm when it comes to talking about uh, all the grains and all the legumes and beans? Uh, am I being am I being um, insensitive by calling that a, a prisoner diet or a slave diet, or do you think that's accurate uh, reading in anthropology and, and history of humans? Yeah, I mean, I do think that is. There's a lot of accuracy with that, and we know that that's what was fed to slaves and you know folks like that for sure. Uh, it's cheap. I mean, you can feed the masses that way. You can get calories. You can fill their bellies, but you're not doing anything for their health. And the interesting thing is now is they're trying to gaslight people into saying that is superior nutrition. You need to load up on lentils and whole grains right. And, right. and, 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 and just to, just to have a, just a, you know, Mark Hyman's got his pegan diet where meat is a condiment. Right. That is even worse because I, you know, because no one wants to go vegan. I mean, there's, there's only a small percentage of people, maybe some highly impressionable teenage girls that go vegan. Most people don't, they quit after a period of time. It's like 1% of the population traditionally never gets really above that despite massive, enormous marketing for that. But what's, what is dangerous is that when they tell people, Oh, just cut back on the meat, you know, and just eat more beans and lentils and have meatless Mondays and vegan Fridays as they do in New York. Um, that to me is a more dangerous message Absolutely. because people would buy that because no one, no, one, no one's going to go full vegan. No one's going to, don't ever go full retard, right? No one's ever does that. But 
the, the people, there are people that are convinced that they should be cutting back on meat. When, when, yes. when my message is you should be cutting back on garbage, junk food, and then you should eat more high quality food like meat or eggs or, you know, cheese there if you tolerate it. That to me is uh, where we need to go. But yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is, it is a poverty diet. It is a peasant diet. It is a slave diet. It is a prisoner diet, whatever it is. And I mean, some of the concern is, you know, people are like, hey, there's only so much good food to go around and you guys make do with the garbage and we're going to eat like kings. And, and that's what yeah. really, that's the reality. But I think you're right. The ultimate propaganda coup is convincing people that a slave diet, a prisoner diet is the healthiest diet you can eat. I mean, how genius is that? Like, we're not going to have to enforce it. They're going to they're going to believe it and actually self-enforce. And so many people are falling for this. And you you alluded to this. And I think you're exactly correct. It's young people who don't know better yet. It's young people who have never looked at the science. It's teenage girls who, who you know, they have a soft heart. And I get it. I remember watching a documentary about a chicken farm when I was 10 or 11 years old. And they mistreated the poor chickens. And it broke my heart as a 10 year old. And I didn't eat eggs for a year or two unless they came from my, my grandma Henson's farm where I knew the chickens were properly treated. I get it. I understand that. But at the same time, if you're an adult, you should have put away childish thinking. You should be thinking like an adult. I need to be feeding my body the food that gives me the best health so I can be the best husband or best wife for my family. I need to be feeding my children the diet that's going to help their brain develop and their body develop and their IQ develop. Big deal. Big deal for folks. And so I know it hurts your heart and it hurts my heart still to this day to think about the poor animals being mistreated in the, in the factory farms, but we're currently stuck with that model. I don't know of a way we can get around that. All I can do is spend all my time and money uh, trying to help regenerative ranching grow so that eventually every animal gets to live the life that they should, they deserve to live and have one bad minute out of a beautiful life when they're harvested. And then all that grass they've eaten is converted into nutritious, delicious meat and fat. And then we have that because that's what our species has done since we've been on this planet. And, and that's one thing, I, I don't know if you've dug into the anthropology and the paleoanthropology and the archeology, span but the more I talk about diet, the more I find myself reading in archaeology and in anthropology, because in those circles, Dr. Baker, it's self-evident. They know without a doubt that humans have eaten meat, they've breathed air, they've drank water, and they've played in the sunshine for the 250 to 300,000 years we've been on this planet. Like, it's not even up for debate in anthropological circles. They know that. They can tell from the stable isotope analysis. How do modern-day nutrition researchers, how does it not occur to them to think maybe we should look at the anthropological re research. Maybe maybe what we ate 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, maybe that matters. Why, do, why doesn't the tough school of nutrition think that way? Why doesn't the Harvard School of Health think that way? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, if you take a wild animal and you put them in the zoo and you go, what do I need to feed this animal? You're going to go look at what they eat in the wild. You're not going to go to the grocery and say, hey, animal, eat whatever you want. You know, it's a and that's sort of the approach we have now. A lot of people will say, well, we don't live in the, the same world we had 50,000 years ago. And True. so much is different in the nutrition. We don't even have access to the same food. So there's some of that. But I mean, honestly, as you probably are aware, you know, back in when the American Dietetics Association was founded way back in 1917 by uh, some Seventh-day Adventists, yeah. uh, they have a vegetarian bias from the get go. From the beginning of modern nutrition, it has been meat is bad meat causes lustful thoughts cause you to masturbate to cause yep. you to have impure whatever so i mean we've, we've got that as a baseline and we, it's just been a lot of confirmation by so we do studies as you know nutrition science in general is just not very good it's not a pure science it's not math okay. it's not physics it's it's a, it's subject to so much bias and confounding and it's easy to design studies to to support your hypothesis and we don't do a lot of testing of hypothesis we do a lot of studies to confirm our suspicions and we can design those studies to do so and we've had i mean something like 80 85 percent of the nutritional research is all observational data which is basically garbage i mean it's it's so uh uh you know it's almost a waste of time and I, it frustrates me we still are seeing studies like this harvard study that came out 
three or four months ago saying red meat increases your risk for diabetes by 62%. And yet I see people that eat nothing but red meat and their diabetes goes away. How do those two, away. two facts come together? Well, one isn't really a fact, particularly when you call lasagna red meat, and you call sandwiches red meat, and you don't account for how much sugar the patient is yep. eating in their diet. I mean, so, but, but that gets the headline. And the frustrating thing is what grabs the headline is this nonsense. And then you get a study where, uh, you know, you show like David Ludwig's Harvard uh, uh, um, carnivore study. You know, there's no it's not on The New York Times. It's not on the on the CNN, like all these other garbage studies are out there. And when we look at who's on the board of directors for all these media outlets, they've all got pharmaceutical people on the on their boards. Their advertising is you know, 40 percent farm or something like some ridiculous number. Uh, so, Some yeah, of them I mean, up to 70 percent of their ad revenue comes from big pharma. And then if you say, OK, well, what percentage comes from big pharma and big food? Mm. It's it's 90 percent of their ads. And so they're never going to talk about Dr. Ludwig's carnivore study because they would literally lose 90 percent of their ad budget if they pissed off big food and big pharma. Yeah, it's interesting. You remember that back years ago, there was a guy from Iowa, University of Iowa, he's a professor, did the Twinkie diet, right? He said, I can just eat Twinkies in a calorie deficit and lose weight. And he did. He lost weight. Sure. Now, could you sustain that for a very long period of time? No. Uh, and it got all kinds of, you know, you've heard about it, right? And this is 10, 15 years ago. Yep. All kinds of media covered that story. And then uh, Nick Norwich does a study with Oreo cookies and not one major media outlet picked that up. And it was, it was, you know, similar sort of basically premise. Look, yep. I can eat Oreo cookies and lower my LDL cholesterol. That should grab some headlines, but does it? No, because it doesn't support the pharma food, you know, mafia. It does It doesn't, it doesn't support their model. Yep, absolutely. Uh, can one of the moderators put uh, Kurdish waters in a little short timeout? They're they're getting carried away. Uh, there are a lot of purists in the carnivore, and and you know, anytime you talk about nutrition, Doctor Baker, it for some reason it brings up religious fervor in people, and you've noticed that. I know you have, and and I've noticed that, and and I get it, but at the same time, that's not very helpful. And so there are carnivore people out there who are like, look, if you drink coffee you're not a carnivore and you're not going to get any of the benefits. Uh, if you drink tea, if you, if you use mustard, that's a plant. You shouldn't do that, that you're going to destroy any benefit from a carnivore diet. Are you a carnivore purist? And also I was told to ask you this question. Uh, there's actually a YouTube channel now dedicated to denigrating you and me and Nisha and other people in the ketovore carnivore community saying that we are closet omnivores that you eat broccoli every damn day and you're a damn liar if you say you don't and so i want to get you on the record are you a closet omnivore and what do you think about the the religious purists in the carnivore movement that say it has to be a hundred percent meat based or you're not going to get any benefits yeah i mean i am uh Certainly supportive of people that want to do a strict carnivore diet. I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think for some people, it's actually better. And I yes. am pretty close to that, you know, 99% of the time. But um, my diet is and has been for now almost eight years has been, gosh, 95% beef, you know, three to 4% eggs. Sometimes I'll put some cheese in there. Sometimes a little a piece of fish here and there. And that's it, literally. Now, in those eight years, have I ever eaten something that has some plants on it? Very rarely. And we're talking, you know, I've had a piece of birthday cake once or twice a year when my kids have a birthday or something like that. So, I mean, uh, it's in it's insignificant amounts of these foods that, that I've had. I don't, I mean, a few months ago, I was, you know, Nick had talked about his Oreo cookies, lowering his LDL cholesterol. So I did a similar experiment for one week where I ate some apples. Uh, I ate hundred grams of you know, carbs via apples. And, you know, I actually didn't do much to my cholesterol and it made my gut hurt. And I was like, I don't need, you know, I don't do that, but I'm not an omnivore in the sense that I eat, you know, a bunch of carbohydrates every day. I mean, my diet, like today, I haven't eaten yet today. And I've got a, what do I have? I've got three ribeye steaks in the sous vide right now. That'll, that'll be most of my food today. And that'll probably be it. Probably be it. And, and so I am happy to support people that want to be full carnivore, uh, and I think it works well for some people and some people yep. need to do that. But to, to impart that, that every mm -hmm. single person needs to do that is probably not realistic and not everybody's going to do it. And you're not going to win. That's not how you're going to win friends anyway. I think, I think there has to be some nuance and you have to accept that, uh, you know, 
purism is hard because I live in a world where there's air pollution. I live in a world where there's noise pollution and light microplastics forever. Everything, everywhere. And I can't isolate myself from everything. So I have to do the best I can. And I, yeah, there's some things I have more control over than other things. But if I'm going to go live on the top of the Himalayan mountains with some, you know, Tibetan monks or something like that and, and never expose myself to any modern chemicals, you know, good luck. It's, it's not likely to happen. So I think you have to realize uh, if you do the right thing, the vast majority of the time, you're going to get a re- good result and it's going to be sustainable. And I think that's, Absolutely. that's important, but there are people that, there are people that can't deviate or if they cheat, it's a bad idea. Or if they have totally that and, piece of chocolate, it turns into a friggin' six months yep. disaster. So yep. yes, that, that can help be helpful for some people, but and not here's how, time. here's how I explain this. This is a normal distribution curve. Okay. There are people on this end of the spectrum that can live on Twinkies and Pepsi Cola and Cheetos. And for at least a few years, do pretty damn good. There are other people that need to be low carb, maybe low carb vegetarian, but still pretty low carb. Most people, when you get to keto, ketovore, that's where they're going to realize their best health. And if if Dr. Baper, if you'll point to the 1% over on the other side, you see that? Yeah, I see it on the right of the bell curve. Yeah. I yeah, right point, up, point yeah. to that with your finger so people will know what I'm talking about. I think there's a subset of people yeah. who absolutely have to eat pure lion diets. They have to be 100%. You're on, you're getting there. There, there, there you go. There but people over on that end of the curve, it's it like needs touch to my be nose and close my eyes. Or nothing else. And, and, but yeah. the, and then some people need to be ketoboard, which would be the green over there where it's just almost all meat. But there is this variability in the human, not maybe not genetics, but in epigenetics and all the switches that have been flipped. And so the carnivore purists, come on, guys, maybe for you, you do need to be strict lion diet only, but not everybody has to be that way. So please ease up on the on the fervor. Yeah, I would I would one other comment on that. And sometimes it's it's temporal and and if for a period of time you may need to be strict carnivore and then you yeah. fix whatever's wrong with you and then you might have a little bit more uh capacity and, that, and that's one of the things we do at rivera we we will eliminate what we need to sustain fix disease and then maybe try to reincorporate and so i yeah. think that's an important aspect to realize because why are so many people's guts messed up what is this going on that they can't even tolerate a damn blueberry you know i mean it just doesn't make sense until you you say okay we, the, the modern food system is so filled with God knows what. I mean, all these thickeners, emulsifiers, preserves, there's artificial colors, artificial flavors, you know, these these things that are banned in friggin' Europe. I mean, it's like half our food supply we couldn't even eat in Europe. I mean, it's crazy to think that as Americans, we're exposed to this constantly. What is it doing to our gut? We don't know. I mean, these these things that get the, the, the grass is generally recognized as safe designation. They test to make sure if it does it acutely kill you or is it acutely genotoxic? And if it doesn't do that, Go at it, and and again, yeah. we're on this we're on this, uh, you know, uh, phase four human trial. You know, basically, and all this food we've been eating for all these god awful. You know, I, one of the things that drives me crazy is you have dietitians. A lot of them have been have been shown to take money from these processed food industries. Yeah. Say there are no bad foods, right? Eat, eat everything in moderation. When I look out there and I see uh, bright blue. Captain Crunch flavored artificial maple syrup. I'm saying that is not food. No human needs to eat, eat that garbage. Exactly. And yet there's people out there saying, oh, a little bit's not going to kill you, right? It's not going to kill you, but it's going to make you sick over time. And, and this is a thing we're fighting against. Yep. And I totally agree with you. And I think that everybody in the low carb, keto, ketovore, and carnivore space, all of us, me and you included, we need to, we need to start defining what food is. Okay. I don't consider Lucky Charms food. Food, I think there's a list of criteria that you have to meet before you even get to call what you're making food, okay? And so if, if it's inflammatory, if it's nutrient deficient, if it's if it's going to cause your blood sugar and your insulin levels to spike, I don't even think you get to call that food ultimately. And when we've got the American Diabetes Society up and running and when Rivera was running half of the world, we're going to make that we're going to make that guideline if not law you don't get to call lucky charms food no you might be able to call it dessert or bullshit treat cuz that's what it is it's not food that will sustain you and keep you alive and keep you healthy for decades 
That's the definition of real food. As we come to the end of this, Dr. Baker, I want you to give everybody what you consider the just the most important kernel, the most important takeaway with regards to human nutrition, human diets, the big food, the big pharma, all of it. Wrap it up and put a bow on it and kick it right in the ass for everybody. Yeah, Ken, just before I do that, I want to just, you mentioned all these weird things you don't want to call food anymore. I was in a conference in the UK talking, and one of the psychiatrists who was presenting called these things, these junk products, recreational drugs. And I think that's really how we should view these things. These are actually recreational drugs and they should be treated. So, and they have the same effects on our body as many of these drugs do. But I mean, I think that really, um, you know, I think you have to realize that you have been under the spell of what we consider health and nutrition. And it is, it is very, as I mentioned earlier, just dis, disempowering to think that if I get an illness I am dependent upon my doctor to prescribe me some kind of drug. And that's not the reality. For most things, the reality is you have within your own power the ability to heal yourself. Now, you might need some support and help, but I mean, it is within your power. And that is very much a different situation because now you don't have to. I mean, it's, it's funny you see how doctors are rated. Oh, my doctor always fulfills my prescription on time. That gives him a good mark. You think about that. My doctor got me off medication. That's a good doctor, right? Absolutely. So I think we have to reframe what we think about, because I will tell you where the allopathic medical system is going. Most physicians are going to be replaced with a computer terminal AI where you're going to go in there. There's going to be a little thing you stick your finger in. It's going to take some blood. It's going to analyze yep. it on the spot. It's going to tell you what, what disease you have and the drugs are in the mail the next day. And yep. there's going to be a doctor in the background signing off on that, never sees you, never talks to you. Yep. as is already the case for a lot of these mail by order drugs that's where medicine's going because ai will will work the pharmaceutical system and the pharmaceutical people will be so happy because they don't have to bribe the doctors anymore they don't have to take yep. them out on you know expensive uh you know conferences and buy their offices donuts and suck up to them like they like as you know they do ken sure. so that's where medicine's going so it's either going to totally be that or it's going to be another alternative like rivero or american diabetes association or something else so either uh, you know, and, and again, it's, it's, it's within your power. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a really empowering message because when you feel dependent, it is depressing and it sucks not being able to, to be in control of your own future. So I think, you know, the future is yours. I totally agree. And I love that as a closing statement, everybody watching, you know, a friend or a loved one who needs to hear what Dr. Baker just said, please share this on your social media right now. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Keep doing the work you're doing and keep kicking ass on social media until me and you both get banned. That's fine. We'll find somewhere else to, to preach. Thank you so much.